Not everyone who games on PC is a capital E enthusiast. Some people don't replace tech until it breaks, and won't upgrade their gaming PC until it can't run today's games anymore. Recently, I've looked at several high-end custom-builds from a decade ago to see how well they've endured the test of time, though as they would have cost four figures back in the day, one might have had higher expectations of them. This time, I'm lowering the bar. For this video, I wanted to pick up a reasonably authentic 2013-era PC that would have sat in the £500 to £600 price range, and the answer came from Sex, the UK-based second-hand tech retailer I buy quite a lot of stuff from for this channel. As I've come to expect from Sex shopping by now, there was a disappointing lack of clarity in the description, but I did at least know the core specs and could infer something about the PC from that. From the description, all I could tell was that it had a Socket 1150 Pentium, 8GB of RAM and a 1TB hard drive, £82 delivered for a 4th gen system with that little RAM, no SSD and no graphics card, seemed perhaps a bit much, all things considered, although admittedly it is considerably less than I usually pay for sex. When it arrived, I realised that the timeline was a little bit off. The Pentium G3258's main appeal was that it had an unlocked multiplier, and I'd assumed that the PC might have come with a Z87 motherboard. However, the CPU was released in 2014, and so I shouldn't have been surprised that the PC actually came with a Z97 motherboard from that same year. Although I decided to keep the anachronistic Z97, it has no effect on performance after all, I did want to swap the CPU for something more era appropriate. The 2013 model I chose to replace the Pentium is a Haswell i5-4570, the processor of choice for non-enthusiast PCs back then. With four cores and four threads, it might be lacking somewhat compared to what's on the market today, but at the time, this was the gaming sweet spot, and its then-new AVX2 instruction set puts it apart from the older, popular i5s like the 2500. I picked this one up for a very reasonable £7 at my local store, Perhaps a 4670K would have been more fitting for the fancy Z97 motherboard, and the tower cooler from Alpenfön will be serious overkill for the 84 watt locked i5, but considering the other parts I have in mind, I'm pretty confident this thing won't be CPU limited. The RAM is, mercifully, a dual channel kit of Team Group DDR3-1600. It would be pretty trivial to upgrade to 16GB, but that would have been considered mostly overkill for gamers on a budget at the time. The storage setup is also rather limited, but again, I had no intention of upgrading. If I were a coward, I'd treat myself to an SSD for the operating system and page file, but solid state storage was far from common in 2013 budget builds. I may live to regret this, given the impact having a page file assigned to spinning rust can have on a more demanding modern game, but I was determined to commit to the bit. Obviously, I wasn't going to rely on the 4570's integrated graphics. Intel iGPUs were doing everything in their power to earn their terrible reputation at the time, and I had ambitions slightly higher than Minesweeper. A key development in GPUs in 2013, one that would go on to become a big deal in the future, was DX12 feature compatibility. AMD released a number of GCN 2-based graphics cards in 2013 that boasted this feature support, the first of which was the budget-oriented HD 7790, which would be refreshed into the R7260X by the end of the year. Although at the time there would have been little to distinguish this from the HD 7850 or GTX 650 Ti, that feature support is the reason why the R7260X is still mostly kinda relevant in 2023 and why those other cards aren't. Now, at this point in history, VRAM amount wasn't considered all that critical. Nvidia was reluctant to exceed 2GB on even their more premium models, but AMD were far more liberal with the DRAM chips, and this was one of the few sub-150-pound graphics cards to feature 2GB on board. What it wasn't was a high-end gaming powerhouse. The 260X's Bonaire GPU was similar in design to those found in the 8th gen base consoles, which should give you an idea of what to expect in terms of gaming performance. The case this is all wrapped up in is a Bitphoenix Neos. Not a major brand these days, but they're still around and still produce basically the same cases they used to, just with a few updates to keep up with modern trends. 
For a decade-old budget case, the Neos is more forward-thinking than you'd expect. Granted, it doesn't have a windowed side panel, which any modern case worth its salt would have, and it still has room for optical drives, but it actually has a partial mesh front. Seriously, this feature that NZXT only discovered last year is front and centre on the Neos. My particular case even has the bump that would later appear on the RX 5700 XT reference cooler. Very stylish. Finally, I was initially impressed to see the familiar stencil outline of a Superflower PSU, but while it is an 80 plus gold rated unit, I was somewhat disappointed to see it was only a 350 watt model. This is enough to power the i5 and R7260X, and very much in keeping with the budget theme of the video, but if I were keeping this around for the long term with the intention of using it, I'd be inclined to swap the 350 watt model out for something with a little more oomph. All in all, you'd have paid about £550 for this build in 2013, perhaps after receiving your first month's pay from your service or retail job, back when you still lived with your parents and didn't have to worry about rent and bills. Ten years on, living in a place of your own, financially independent and therefore broke as fuck, would your old reasonably priced gaming PC still be able to play new games, or are you stuck playing the same old titles? Although Far Cry 3 is a 2012 title, it was still among the more demanding games out there, and you'd have needed some pretty high-end hardware to run it at high quality settings even a year later. With my expectations suitably tempered, I was still pretty pleased. At 1080 high, this PC could get close to that platonic ideal of a 50fps average. Power for life, baby! If you're one of those people who think NTSC should determine what constitutes a smooth frame rate, dropping to medium sees averages around 70 FPS, and the only major sacrifice seems to be the amount of popping. 2013 saw the beginning of the new Tomb Raider trilogy, which I think it's fair to say would have been a fairly big draw for new gamers at the time. The built-in benchmark recorded a 71 FPS average at 1080 high settings. I have to say I found this pleasantly surprising, and I'd have been tempted to run the game at even higher settings. At Ultra the average is still over 50 FPS, though admittedly the difference in quality is harder to see, and we don't really have enough horsepower on hand to go as far as enabling tress effects. Another big name launch from 2013 was Bioshock Infinite, which despite its very attractive art style isn't actually all that intensive on hardware. At 1080 high the game can average over 80 FPS, and turning up to very high can still maintain a very satisfactory 65 on average. 1% lows were mostly fine on either quality preset, but the occasional spike meant for very low 0.1% scores, possibly due to loading stutter caused by the hard drive. Foreshadowing intensifies. <laughs> Twenty fourteen's Shadow of Mordor was the first game that actually gave me trouble owing to a lack of VRAM. Although the system can run this game's benchmark at over 30 FPS on average at Ultra and over 45 FPS on high, this was only after I'd manually dropped the texture resolution to medium. Going all out on medium settings comes close to a 60 FPS average, which is pretty impressive as the consoles of that era apparently rarely run the game much above 30 FPS. Everyone's favourite murder spree simulator, GTA V, can hit a solid 60fps average at 1080 normal settings on this setup, though as everyone on the internet will happily point out to you, this is effectively a remaster of a PS3 era title, so a near PS4 equivalent system like this one should have no trouble. Of course, the PS4 runs this game at just 30fps so there's a chance the console version maybe runs with some higher settings. Still, given the choice, I know which I prefer. <music> 2016's Doom reboot is said to hold up pretty well on the GCN architecture compared to GeForce cards of the same era, especially in Vulcan. Given how the R7260X does, I shudder to think how bad the closest GTX would perform. A 30fps average requires dropping to 1080 medium, and in this game, 30fps is just not good enough. Dropping to low gets barely above the ideal 50fps mark, 
but lows dip into the 30s often enough that it's still far from perfect. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Battlegrounds originally released in 2017, but you wouldn't have wanted to try and play it on this PC back then. It took many years of trial and error, mobile and light versions of the game for the developers to get PUBG into a playable state for low spec gamers, and in fairness to them, it certainly is playable now. At 1080 very low, the game scrapes under 50 FPS, and is in my opinion perfectly acceptable. Dropping resolution scaling to 75% raises that average almost to 60, but doesn't have much of a positive impact on minimums. This could be the standard stutter we've come to expect in Battle Royale games, or it could be a sign that the hard drive is becoming a problem. Skipping ahead now to the modern era, things have well and truly fallen apart for this PC. I've run Cyberpunk 2077 on some weak systems in my time, and I'm pretty confident that the GPU isn't the whole issue here. In fact, neither is the 8GB of RAM, as I used to test with 8 gigs quite often and still didn't see stuttering like this. No, I think I'm going to have to lay the blame at the feet of that decade-old hard drive. It took about 2-3 to three minutes to load the save file, and the biggest stutters occurred when moving between areas. When I last tested the R7-260X on a modern PC last year, it could run at 32 FPS with 1% lows of 18. Even at a lower FSR setting, this PC only managed 27 FPS with 1% lows of 1.8. And that's not even taking into account the pop-in, which is reminiscent of the PS4 version back before it was pulled from stores. The picture doesn't change much in Uncharted 4 either. At 1080 low with 50% FSR scaling, the game can run in the mid-20s, and running at a lower base resolution while skipping FSR entirely might see that go closer to 30 FPS. Unfortunately in this case it's still not particularly playable, as the frequent stutters every couple of seconds drag 1% lows into single digits. I tried reloading the save a couple of times, and clearly 8GB of RAM isn't enough to have cached any data, so the hard drive continues to be a choke point. Spider-Man Remastered is a different kind of unplayable. I've seen this phenomenon with the GTX 670 and 690, and even on a Crossfire R9 290X setup. The game will briefly stop to catch its breath while you're trying to swing through Manhattan, meaning that you're left dangling while high quality assets load up. Those previous test setups were running the game from a solid state drive, and I've actually recently seen it occur on one of my CPU tests, so I'm kind of at a loss to narrow it down to one particular cause. The frame rate looks pretty good on paper, but again, I think this weird hang up disqualifies Spider Man as a playable experience. And one final cry for help comes from The Witcher 3. While this is technically a 2015 release, I'm testing the new 2022 remaster. In DX12 at 1080 low with FSR performance enabled, my first run averaged 24 FPS, but with agonisingly poor frame pacing resulting in basically non-stop stutter. Reloading the save to try again, maybe with some cached data, actually made things a bit worse. The save took forever to load and then settle down, and the average FPS actually dropped a couple of frames. Reducing FSR to its lowest setting did help somewhat, but the stutter was still insufferable and even continues outside of the city. If you're trying to run Witcher 3 on an old PC, it's still possible to run the original version, at least on Steam. Simply head into the game's options, choose the beaters menu, and choose classic from the drop-down list. It does have to re-download the game, but I'm 100% sure it'll be worth it. Independently, these components are capable of decent results in more modern titles, provided you lower your expectations. I tested the R7 260X in 2022 and found that, with a heavy-handed approach to resolution scaling, it can actually play a surprising number of today's games. I haven't tested the i5-4570 on its own merits, but I have tested other i5s of similar vintage, and none of them have given the same issues I had with this system. However, I have seen performance like this before, 
The combination of 8GB of RAM, even in dual channel, and an old slow hard drive snowball to create a very specific set of conditions. A perfect shitstorm, if you will. With such a relatively small amount of physical RAM available, the system becomes reliant on the page file, or virtual memory, and that is pulled from the PC storage. In this case, a decade-old 7200 RPM hard drive with 16,000 hours of power on time. Upgrading the RAM to 16GB would be a relative no-brainer, especially now that DDR3 prices are at rock bottom, but a better all-round solution would be to replace the hard drive with a decent-sized SSD. Impossible to do on a budget in 2013, but a very viable option in 2023 that could potentially revitalise this otherwise dying system. With all that in mind then, what could you build for the same amount today, and how well will it hold up for the next decade? I've worked out a list of some near-equivalent priced items, without taking inflation into account, that can be purchased brand new in 2023. The cost of an i5-4570 in 2013 will get you a Ryzen 5 5600X this year, but an overclocking friendly motherboard is a little more expensive, so I've split the difference by dropping to the non-X version of the CPU. £55 is more than enough to get 16GB of DDR4-3600, but £30 isn't enough to get a good case, so again the difference has been split between the two. £50 still only gets you a terabyte of storage, but nowadays it's NVMe solid state instead of an old-fashioned hard drive. SSDs aren't exactly immortal, but have far greater longevity than HDDs and will hold up much better than the drive in the 2013 PC did. I could probably get a well-specified PSU for £40 from a dodgy brand, but spending a little extra gets a lower wattage in exchange for more peace of mind. The 5600 comes with a perfectly good cooler, but in the spirit of matching the original build, I factored in the cost of a basic ID cooling unit. And that just leaves the graphics card. In the UK right now, most options at £115 or less are actually less powerful than the decade-old R7260X, but stretching to £130 allows us to pick up an RX 6400. As flawed as this product is, the RX 6400 does kinda show just how far tech has come in a decade, in its own way. This budget offering has the same memory amount and similar performance to the top-end cards from 2013, all without the need for any supplemental power connectors. That being said, again, the 6400 is a flawed product and definitely the weak spot in this modern £550 build. Whereas the old R7260X was the cutting edge of the middle of the road when it was released, the 6400 is halfway obsolete already, with its 64-bit memory bus and only 4 gigs of VRAM. Games have already started launching that the 6400 struggles with, and sure, maybe these particular games might not be of interest to you right now, doesn't mean this will always be the case. Developers are becoming more bullish about releasing games that are clearly optimised for the ninth generation consoles, and a PS5 or Series X equivalent PC costs a lot more than £550 right now. At the moment I'm actually working on some console killer type content for 2023, and that's only possible thanks to my regular supporters on Patreon and those who've made one-off donations via Super Thanks. If you'd like to chip in, there's a link to Patreon on screen now, and you can also donate using the Super Thanks button underneath the video. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.